Aloha and welcome back to Energy Justice in Hawaii. I do not recall what episode number we're on, probably somewhere between episode five and episode 10 um, of uh, talking to interesting humans, doing interesting uh, equity driven uh, um, projects and work in Hawaii around energy. Uh, today, we are talking about community benefits packages with Leila Kilolu. Did I say, yeah, I've never said your last name out loud before, actually, that's funny. Um, uh, Leila and I are uh, colleagues and friends for a few years now. I, we met when I was in grad school doing research, and then now she is in grad school pursuing her uh, PhD in uh, the Department of Urban and Regional Planning, as well as uh, she is an economist at the Public Utilities Commission. Um, uh, and we uh, most recently have worked closely together uh, on a project with Ho'aku Energy Cooperative Molokai uh, for her research team, Team Nene. Uh, for those of uh, you who are avid subscribers to Energy Justice in Hawaii, probably two or three episodes ago, we, we talked to Sebastian Salark and Todd Yamashita about Team Nene's work for Ho'aku. Um, but today we get to hear from Layla about uh, some of her uh, research and interest in community benefits packages. So welcome, Layla. Did I miss anything in your intro that you want to share? No, you covered it all. Even our team Nene worked together. Um, and it was such a fantastic experience working with Oahu. And we're looking forward to continuing that work. So thank you. Thanks for having me. Oh, my pleasure. Um, great. Well, let's just dive in uh, to what is uh, what are community benefits as they relate to uh, energy? How would you describe them? Wow, Allie, I'm so glad you asked because community benefits um, didn't start off in energy. Um, it started off actually in other contexts like waste, um, uh, such as landfills, um, toxic waste dump, like nuclear um, waste um, sites. Um, um, they've also been used for mining, um, you know, when communities are um, near a uh, mine, a gold mine, maybe, uh, copper, lithium. Um, but what's interesting about community benefits is that they're, they're called all kinds of things. Like um, in the research, you will find them called benefit agreement, benefit sharing agreement, benefit sharing mechanism, community benefit scheme, community benefit agreement, community compensation. There's just like so many names to them, host community agreements, Post community benefits. So actually doing research in this field is part part of it is just like looking for the right terminology because it's being it's been used in so many different planning contexts. Um, I think um, we're still trying to figure out what to call them, but like for today, let's just call them community benefits packages. And I would say in a nutshell, um, in the energy space, the community benefits package is like a mechanism that is used to kind of uh, address perceived Im imbalances um, with the uh, impacts and benefits of a project. Um, and ultimately, I think the goal of a community benefits package is to obtain community acceptance of that project. So, you know, um, I will say like in the case of somewhere like Hawaii, you know, a developer will put together some sort of um, you know, package um, that could include all kinds of things, which, you know, I hope we uh, get to talk about um, in more depth. And, and then in turn, the community will, um, will you know, appreciate and accept that package in an ideal world. And then, you know, the, the project gets built and then everyone is happy. Um, so I think that's ultimately um, what community benefits packages um, are thought of conceptually, but in terms of in practice, it might be a little bit different. Intriguing. So it sounds like they started uh, more along the lines of like extractive developments that had like very obvious uh, physical uh, environmental impacts that might impact the health or quality of life of people who live around it. So it's sort of like a balance of we're going to do this bad thing in your neighborhood, but 
uh, here's a, a little bit of uh, um, money or, or benefits uh, to hopefully balance that scale so that you guys will say yes to our project. Yeah, exactly. And what's interesting is because now that I'm pull, peeling the onion back, if you will, and looking at like the origins of these community benefits packages, like when it came to landfill, um, uh, there, there are all kinds of um, risks that people were experiencing um, on top of the health risks of living next to landfill per se, but you know, uh, your house, your home value might decrease, right? And then there will be um, other sorts of issues relating to safety because of like road work and, and you know, all these trucks coming in and out of your neighborhood and you know, um, just the, the, um, the increased amount of traffic that you might experience living there and um, water quality issues, right? Because, you know, so um, what I saw in the research is that um, um, community benefits packages included things, um, not just, you know, um, a, maybe a reduction in, or just a complete elimination of your garbage bill, for example, but things like groundwater testing um, regularly, um, fire safety, um, safety around the perimeter um, to, to ensure that, you know, there's nothing um, risky happening um, during operations, um, road work, like road safety, um, maintenance. I mean, it, it's really interesting to see like all the different ways in which communities have um, uh, advocated for you know, improve living conditions because of this burden that, that they, they've been carrying or for the greater good, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of energy, I would say that it's a little bit um, more gray because, you know, energy is not particularly renewable energy for some is not necessarily seen as a burden the same way that a landfill might be seen as a burden, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, um, it, it, for that reason, it's it, it's just um, being perceived a little bit differently. Um, but I think there is still a lot of variation with regards to what is being put into these community benefits packages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That point about energy projects having like not as obvious a detrimental uh, monetary impacts or otherwise, I think is really interesting because I've definitely, I think the re renewable energy industry has kind of blinders on when it comes to, you know, why community members would not want a large scale solar project or a large scale wind project in uh, their immediate vicinity. Uh, and I think that Absolutely. is something developers Thank definitely you. need to kind of come to terms with and acknowledge. It's true. And I think if you don't live next to a solar farm or a wind farm, you know, you're like, what's the big deal, you know, but again, I mean, it's um, someone joked to me that, oh, well, the community benefit if uh, is if, of, of a wind farm is if you live in Hawaii Kai and you don't have a wind farm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. like you're getting the benefit, you know, but, you know, the community burden, you know, is, is elsewhere. So what we do have to think about, I think, Part of this as a community outreach or education, not just for the affected communities, but for people in general about the impact that renewable energy does have, right? Because overall, I think the discourse around renewable energy is that it's good. And, and clearly it is good for some things like avoided um, emissions, right? Compared to a coal plant, as an example. But there are, you know, uh, there there are risks and there are trade-offs and, you know, for people who have, you know, lived in certain, in their neighborhoods, you know, changing the landscape is a big deal, right? And um, we don't talk about that as much, about the importance of place and how people, um, our identities are a lot of times tied to where we live. And, um, and, and also the other impacts, like we are not quite, I don't think people are quite clear on what the what the impacts of development of these projects mean for groundwater, as an example, or wildlife, you know, or I mean, you know, and still to this day, there's this 
huge controversy around like, oh, do wind farms really have adverse health impacts? No, you know, and, and so I think there needs to be more clarity um, and scientific based, you know, research that is shared with the wider community on what these impacts are to communities. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I definitely think uh, reflecting on what I said earlier about communities not wanting renewable energy in their area, I think that that feels like a black and white to me. I, uh, I, I feel like I've more heard community members say like how they would like uh, renewable energy or like how it's owned or how it's designed or certain design aspects of it. It's not like a, we hate renewable energy. It's a, uh, this way works better for us than this way. Um, well, I love that you brought up the ownership piece because, mm-hmm. okay, if um, I think this would be a good time to talk about the different types of community benefits um, that I've been seeing in the literature. The first one would be monetary, meaning like a straight up direct payment to an individual or a household, um, you know, in the form of, well, it could be cash or a check or it could be a bill credit, right? It's like, oh, well, you have this thing next to you, so we'll give you this as a discount on your electric bill. Um, There are also direct payments to communities through like a, you know, if there's like a community organization, you know, the developer can write a check to that organization. Um, But, Okay, and then there's also, you know, the the developer providing scholarships or grants to schools. Um, Mm -hmm. There could be um, parks or community centers that are provided to the community. Um, So, you know, it could be all sorts of tangible, tangible, less tangible things. It could be monetary, non-monetary. I think what's interesting is that there are also ownership models and that's what you were talking about how communities like how they want it right and so I think what what, what's interesting that this research is looking at the ways in which uh, communities are being involved in the conversation around these community benefits because it's one thing for a developer to just cut a check and say here you go and it's another thing to for the community to be like this is what we need can you help us with that, right? Um, you know, with your project, you know, maybe we can be part owners of this or whatever. And so there, there just, the, the research seems to suggest that um, communities don't like to be bribed. <laughs> um, and that's, that's not hard to imagine, I think. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, th- th- there's a possibility that community benefits packages could be an opportunity and not a bribe, but it's all in the way that it's being done, right? Mm-hmm. So to your point, I think more conversations with the community at the beginning and not just like thinking that, you know, you can just gift something that the community may or may not need, but they weren't a part of um, coming up with the idea. Mm-hmm. It's not, I don't necessarily think that's going to be um, as effective. Um, but again, I'm, I'm still doing my research in this topic and, um, and part of the reason why I wanted to do the research in this area is because not a lot of empirical studies have been done on community benefits. And um, we, what we're seeing is a lot of just case studies, right? So it's like, in this place, this is what they did. In that place, this is what they did. And then, you know, they're, you know, the researchers are trying to extrapolate based on those one-off or just a few case studies. And what I'm trying to do is um, look at it on a larger, broader scale and see if we can see any sort of patterns. Mm. I realize I didn't even get to ask, I didn't ask you to introduce your research when I introduced you. So when you say your research, you are talking about your uh, your research for your PhD. In, yes, uh, correct. Yes. Yes. And, uh, oh. Give us a little blurb of uh, what the um. <laughs> PhD is about so that we can uh, track your, uh, your outputs. Okay, well, thank you. I think I need to work on my elevator pitch for this because I am being asked this question. 
and quite often and then I go off into like an hour-long tangent and <laughs> like walks away from me and I'm like why what, what did I say <laughs> um okay so I'm what I'm trying to do is it's very ambitious I want to create a database of community benefits packages um, in the United States um, I might start off with just a few states if it just gets to be too much to do, um, because I am a one person show right now. Um, but the goal is to catalog all the different community benefit packages, quantify them, and then see if there are relationships between certain variables. So um, I'm not sure yet what I'm going to be measuring, but I think ultimately what we're trying to spot, see is if there's a relationship between um, the is there a relationship between the type of compensation, right, whether it's monetary, non-monetary, and community acceptance? And the reason why this, this um, research is significant is because it seems that community benefits packages are trending right now, right? Like people are like, oh yeah, just give them a community benefits package and they'll, you know, they'll accept your project, right? But we're not really sure if that's true. We don't know really what the relationship is. So that is why, you know, I thought this was a great opportunity to like dig deep and see empirically, like it's what, what is that? What does it look like when we look at the data? Yeah, what a fascinating, you did a great job, a little elevator pitch. No one walked away from you there. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, love that, Blair. Um, I have a question about community benefits packages. How are they usually uh, um, decided on? Like, when is the format? Who who's talking to who? And uh, how do they get selected? Oh my gosh, that's a great question, Allie. And right now, I don't have an answer for you because it's not easily found. Like that that kind of information is what's taking me so long to do just one. You know, looking at just one case study so okay um and okay some of the issues that i'm having are how do we quantify some of these benefits right i mean some of them are going to be straightforward others are not going to be but in terms of this challenge um i downloaded like a data set from the eia which is the energy information administrator eia right yeah anyway they have a bunch of data and i found like 4,000 uh, solar projects in the US. And I'm basically going down that list and seeing if there's a benefits package associated with that, right? And that means just kind of like combing through the internet and seeing like what, what was written, you know, in news sources. And then sometimes, not sometimes, actually a lot, going in through these dockets, my, you know, these docket management systems of different states and combing through those documents. And um, it's so it's, it's, you know, that though is the question. It's like, to what extent were communities involved in the process of putting this together? Um, as um, I do believe I watched one of your previous shows with Ryan Hurley and Lance Collins, and they were talking about the Maui project, the Kahana project. And um, I actually wasn't involved in that docket, so I don't want to act like a no and all with that one. However, I do know that that particular project had mediation involved, right? So you had the West Maui Preservation Association, which is a community-based group, and they actually went into mediation with the developer, um, Interject, and um, they came out with an agreement. And um, I'm not sure if that's common. I would like to say it's not. Um, obviously, in the jurisdictions that have some sort of mandated, you know, law that says you must developer provide um, community benefits to the community, um, that will probably be, you know, more institutionalized, more formal. But in other cases, I would imagine that the developer, you know, um, creates this package. Maybe there's some involvement with the community. I'm not sure yet what that looks like. But um, the issue though, and I think Lance and Ryan talked about this, is enforceability. Is that 
who is going to hold the developer accountable if those if those community benefits are not you know being upheld so um that also is an issue when doing research in this because you know there may be community benefits that i find but how do i know that they're going to be enforced and should i then uh discount those and you know unless we see that it did happen so all this to say that this research is um is challenging for many reasons and i was interested to see that no one had done this work yet and but now i see why <laughs> there's just so many you know gray areas that it's really hard to yeah to measure yeah yeah <laughs> I definitely see that. And I would imagine that could also be uh, a reason that some developers are hesitant to enter into a community benefits negotiation because they first have to identify who it is that they're negotiating with and like what is a meaningful sum mm -hmm. of money or a, a project or something that they're offering. Uh, which does not mean that they should not uh, dive into that work. Uh, I think. Yeah. Well, the uh, one of my mentors told me very aptly. She said, "Well, you could pay for it now, or you pay for it later, right?" And yeah. that's exactly what we see: is that if if you know the work isn't done on the front end, then it comes back in the form of a lawsuit, or you know, just uh, delays, um, just the project being canceled. So I think it is a best practice for developers to work closely with community so that the community feels that <clears throat> this project benefits them, you know, in some way, uh, in yeah. adequately, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we had, uh, thank you for remembering uh, the episode with uh, Ryan Hurley and Lance Collins and their colleague Bianca Izaki. Yes, um, Bianca as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, joined us too. And, and I think their sentiment was that uh, this was kind of an, uh, a precedent setting event that now uh, this shows that, you know, if, uh, if a developer tries to avoid doing their homework uh, early on, they will eventually have a test later and it, it will uh, um, be obvious evident that they did not do their homework and they will be sent back to do their homework. Um, mm -hmm. So even if there is not like uh, a law that says a community benefits package has to be X amount of money, uh, mm -hmm. hopefully they see the interjects and the West Maui case and say, oh, we should do our homework now. Yeah, well, you know, I think one thing that we learned, um, you know, with the communities here is that, well, we could be very surprised on what the communities actually want, right? Sometimes it's not about money. It's sometimes it's about ownership. Um, mm -hmm. It's sometimes it's about, you know, um, having their voices actually heard and and taken into account in decision making. It's you know mm -hmm. it's about sovereignty, if you will. Mm -hmm. So, um, <laughs> it I I think that um, I think that that's a and this is actually probably getting away from my research, although um, it will probably manifest its way somewhere in there, but it comes down to trust. I think really you could have the best process, right? Let's say we find in the research that like, oh, if you, you know, if, if the developer does this and then with the community and then, you know, the decisions are made in this way, shape or form, then everyone will be happy. But I think what what um, what what it truly is is like what is the level of trust between the developer and the community and and the other um, parties involved because that's you know that's when things really move um, that's when you come to agreement and um, people are actually willing to to talk to each other and figure out like what it is that we want and what is it that we can give you know and when and there, when there's like that kind of feeling and that sense of transparency and, and you know, trust, again, trust, then, um, you know, people are going to feel more willing to work together, not just in this context, but in future contexts, right? And I think, I think particularly for Hawaii, that's really important because we live on islands where 
we're so connected and it's like can't avoid can't avoid people right so mm -hmm. you got to do the right thing like at the beginning and continue to do to do the right thing um because everyone's gonna know if you don't <laughs> yeah yeah uh that feels very true i am um... Your comment about community ownership made me uh, uh, think of uh, the parallel of like uh, with a movement that I have seen in the more the philanthropy field about um, uh, traditional philanthropy is about um, I have lots of money and you don't have money so I'm going to give you a chunk of money every year uh, to do what I told you to do and then you will tell me that you did it and we'll like go back and forth and it kind of perpetuates the system of like I have the thing and you don't have the thing and I will be very generous and give you the thing um, that uh, community ownership and community driven philanthropy is like a movement within the philanthropy field that is like a little more radical it's thinking about uh, how do we kind of shift the power away from uh, the traditional source of money and the people who need the money um, and that ownership that like, uh, how do we include you in the decision making process? How does the community benefits package move from uh, X thousand dollars a year to you guys for uh, the benefit of us getting to own and operate our project in your neighborhood to like, uh, this is a project that you guys own and operate in your neighborhood because it serves you and we are the conduit to help you get there. And I think that is like, in my mind, the, the ultimate community benefits package is no need community benefits package because the whole project is for community benefit, but. Yeah. Um, and there was actually, I mean, uh, one example that I read is, uh, I think it was in Scotland. It was either Scotland or England. But uh, that there was a wind, there were wind, a wind farm, and the developer gifted one of the turbine turbines turbines to the community so that they owned it outright, and you know um, were, were able to you know receive all the benefits from that one, you know, so the profits and all that from from that one. And so, I mean, I think that's like one example of how communities can be made owners, part owners. Mm -hmm. I think also when you think about the word equity, and I know this is, you know, what your show is about, equity um, in financial terms is um, ownership, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's, um, it's interesting if you think about equity in those terms, because then um, what's also great about um, ownership for communities, um, if you're a developer, is that the community feels accountable for that project as well, right? They feel a sense of pride, like, hey, that's my solar farm, you know, and we have to take care of this because it's our asset. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think it is a more beneficial way of like seeing a project to the extent that a uh, developer can find ways that a community can really be part owners of a project in whatever way that look that that makes sense for them and for the community. Absolutely. Um, we're uh, coming to the end of our show here. We just have a little less than a minute left. If you uh, tell us a little bit about like, what are the future questions you're asking in your research about this that we can uh, tune in maybe in the a couple months and hear more about what's on your mind. Yeah, thank you. Um, so what I'm interested to see is, um, you know, eventually is if there's a relationship between um, making a community benefits package mandatory and um, community acceptance, meaning should we make laws that make community benefits packages mandatory? Um, yeah, and yeah, and you know, we have such few examples, so it's kind of hard to do that empirically right now. But the research seems to suggest that when you do make um, community benefits packages mandatory, communities are more willing to accept it. But the caveat is that the community needs to feel that they were part of developing that package. Mm. What an interesting future question. I can't wait to have you back on the show so we can ask you about what you found in that research. Well, thank you for having me and I look forward to being in your future show. This is great. This is fun. Yeah. Thank you, Rayla. And thank you audience for tuning in again. 
Uh, we'll see you in a couple weeks, maybe. Hola.